sisters and brothers in Christ. You may be seated. Not only Isaiah, 700 years foretold of the coming of the Christ child, but when Jesus was only eight days old and Mary and Joseph presented him at the temple, there was an old prophet by the name of Simeon who was there. And Simeon said to Mary, his mother, Jesus' mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many, and for a sign that is opposed. And Mary, a sword will pierce through your own soul also. A prophecy from Simeon when Jesus was eight days old. Well, sisters and brothers in Christ, the year was uh, 1933, and the place was Murphy, North Carolina. The Morgan family was being evicted by the police. They were out of money. They were being thrown out of their house. They pled poverty, and in order to raise enough money just to fill the gas tank full so they could get out of town, they decided to hold a revival meeting. You see, uh, Mr. Murphy, or Mr. Uh, Morgan, rather, uh, was a, a preacher of sort. And so he held a, a revival hoping to have a little collection. And he had his young daughter, uh, a blonde, cute little girl, sing a song. And at the revival, there was a man by the name of John Niles. And he was captivated by that song. So after the revival was over, he told the young girl, he said, I'll give you 25 cents every time you sing this verse for me over and over and over because I want to write down the words to the verse. Well, John Niles, later on, went to add a, med a melody, and a Christmas hymn was created. And the chorus went like this. I wonder as I wander out under the sky how poor baby Jesus was born for to die. For poor, ornery people like you and like I, I wonder as I wander out under the sky. Well, that's the theme uh, this week, as we ask the question, as we have each week during Advent, what was Jesus born for? Why did Jesus come? Simple answer from the song is, for poor, ornery people like you and like I. You see, the important issue of Christmas is not so much that Jesus came, but why he came. There was no salvation in his birth by itself, nor did the sinless way in which he lived have any redemptive force for you or for me. His example, as flawless as it was, his teachings of love, his revealing of that great truth from heaven, none of those things could save us from our sins. There was a price that had to be paid for our sin. Somebody had to die for poor, ornery people like you and like I. Only Jesus, the perfect Son of God, could make satisfaction for our sins. Yes, he came to earth to reveal God to humankind. He came to teach us the truth. He came to fulfill the law. He came to offer his kingdom. He came to show us how to live. He came to reveal God's love. He came to bring peace. He came to heal the sick. He came to minister to all those who were needy. But all of those reasons in that whole long list was not the ultimate purpose for his coming. He could have done all of them without necessarily have been the savior of the world. He could have appeared like an angel in the Old Testament and done all those things. No, he had one more reason for coming. He had to die. Now here's a side to the Christmas story that we don't often emphasize, right? Those soft little hands fashioned by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary were made so that one day nails would go through them. And those baby feet, pink and unable to walk, would one day stagger up a hill called Golgotha, and they too would have nails driven through them. That sweet infant's head, uh, with sparkling eyes and smiling mouth, was formed so what, that one day man could plant a crown of thorns into it. Yeah, that tender baby, warm and soft wrapped in swaddling clothes, would one day be ripped open by a spear. Jesus was born to die. Now, don't think that I'm trying to put a damper on your Christmas joy. I mean, this week we light the pink candle for joy. Huh? Far be it from 
me to do that. We have just got to be very careful, my friends, not to leave Jesus in a manger. Keep in mind that his birth was important, but it was only the first step in God's plan of salvation. Remember the triumph of Christ's sacrificial death that gives meaning to his humble birth. You can't celebrate one without the other. Our reading in the book of Luke this week will take us all the way up into Holy Week. No doubt that's what old Simeon was thinking about when Mary and Joseph at the eight-day-old uh, birthday of Jesus took him to the temple for the pre presentation. And old man Simeon spoke to Mary and said, This child is appointed for the fall and rising of many, and he will be opposed by many. And Mary, as for you, a sword's going to pierce your heart. That sword pierced Mary's heart, I'll tell you what, on Good Friday when she was there at the foot of the cross and her child was pierced with a sword to make sure he had fully died. Simeon not only had prophesied this death, the death of Jesus, but he also prophesied that Jesus would be a sign that would be opposed, okay? Through all of history, the history of mankind, right up until this present day, including this present day, people rise or fall upon God's plan of reconciliation that demanded, yes, the incarnation, the coming into our flesh by his only son, but by doing also what no other human being could have done to satisfy the justice of God's wrath upon sin. One human who opposed Jesus as the newborn king was the old rotten king by the name of Herod. The gospel lesson for today. Our gospel reading has Jesus standing before Herod, and Herod's heard about him. He wants to see a miracle that he's heard so much about. He, he asked Jesus all kinds of questions, but Herod wasn't worth the time of day. Jesus did nothing. Jesus said nothing. So Herod mocked him, dressed him in that elegant robe that one day soldiers would shake dice over at the foot of the cross. Not swaddling clothes, but he mocked him with the robe of a king, placed by sinful human beings, by the son of Herod the Great, who when Jesus was born as a baby, killed, slaughtered all the boy babies in the town of Bethlehem under two years old because he wanted to get Jesus dead then before he ever grew up. As this week we read through Luke's gospel, and we should be at, you know, chapter 17 today. If you haven't started, this would be a great day to start, okay? Each day, whatever the day of the December it is, that's the chapter you should be in. We're really preparing our hearts as we do so for the Christmas Eve reading of Luke chapter 2. This week we will see an answer in our reading for what Jesus was born for. Poor baby Jesus was born for to die for poor, ordinary people like you and like I. And isn't it interesting, by the way, that shortly after the birth of the Messiah, wise men came from the east and brought with them gifts. Yeah, they followed the star and they got to the manger and they worshipped him and they gave him gold and frankincense and myrrh as gifts. Now, one of those gifts was particularly unusual, myrrh. Now like frankincense, it was a perfume. But unlike frankincense, myrrh smelled of death. In the ancient world, it was used to embalm a corpse. And the women went to the tomb to embalm Jesus with myrrh. It pointed, even as the wise men knelt at the manger, it pointed to Jesus' death. Jesus was born to die. So that's the first part of our Advent sermon series, Why Was Jesus Born? But each week in our sermons, we have been also asking the question, well, what were we born for then? What was I born for? What were you born for? Seems to me the answer is, first of all, to say that we too were born to die. The wages of sin is death. We're all by nature children of wrath. 
There's none righteous, no, not one. We're all by nature spiritually blind, dead, enemies of God. St. Paul says in Romans chapter 7, Oh, so I find the law at work in me, and whenever I want to do good, evil is right there with me. What a wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Some of you maybe are old enough to remember when the altar paraments and the pastor's stoles and even the advent candles were not blue, they were purple. The same color that we use for Lent. Now there was a theological reason for that. If Advent is the season of preparation, then to prepare our hearts for the coming of the Lord, whether it's at Bethlehem's manger or through word and sacrament today in our lives, or as we await his coming in glory at the end of time, we need to prepare through repentance. That was what the voice in the wilderness, the Advent prophet John the Baptist, called out to the people. He said, I'm come to prepare the way. How? Repent for your sins. Receive the baptism of repentance. And it was the very text that Jesus used in his first sermon in Capernaum at the, at the, te- at the synagogue when he began his ministry. He said, repent. The, the promises of the prophets have all been fulfilled. Now the kingdom of God is among you. So the good news on this day, while you and I indeed were born to die because of our sin, Christ also was born to die as satisfaction for our sins. And thanks be to God, death could not hold him. Above the manger, yes, was the shadow of death on the cross, but beneath the cross there lies an empty tomb. And that empty tomb shows us that the way for us to live is to live as though our life will never end. Huh? Death has no power over the child of the king. He said, because I live, you shall live also. So now the question is, how shall we live? Well, sin meant that we were born to die. Forgiveness of sin means that we were meant to live. And as we read the final chapters of Luke's gospel this week, we will learn lessons in Christ-directed living. Today, if you're reading today, maybe you've already read it, chapter 17, you'll read about 10 lepers who were healed. Only problem is only one went back to thank Jesus. So we ought to ask the question this week, how's it going with our thankfulness? Hmm? Maybe this week we can throw some extra thanks to the Lord for the blessings he has given to us. We will also read about a widow who just kept bugging a judge until he finally gave her whatever it was she wanted lest she would wear him out with her consistent begging. And Jesus told that parable so that we would always pray, never give up, keep praying over and over again. How's that one going for you? Maybe this week we can throw up some extra prayers. There's plenty of things to pray for in this crazy world in which we live. We will also read about a rich young ruler who asked Jesus, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, well, keep the law. But if you can't, go and sell everything you own and give it to the poor. That was a tough one because the man was really rich. So Jesus ended up saying it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And when you realize the affluence that we live in here on the west side of Cleveland, especially when you compare it to the rest of the world, well, have you thought recently about generosity? Hmm? About your stewardship of all the blessings that God has given you and how you're using them or misusing them? We'll also read about Zacchaeus. He was a short little guy. We know that because he had to climb a tree in order to see Jesus. There were so many crowds around Jesus. But he was a tax collector. That meant he was a real sinner. And Jesus called him down from the tree and said, let's go to your house. Jesus ate with tax collectors and sinners. And he taught Zacchaeus that he had come to seek and to save the lost. 
love-filled lives. Huh? Zacchaeus, I love you so much and I love all the rest who are lost that my mission is to reach you with that love. And finally, we'll read a parable about Jesus. Uh, Jesus told when, when the king gave three men talents. He gave to the first one ten talents, and the man went out and invested them and made ten more. And he gave to the second man five talents, and he went out and invested them and made five more. And the king said to them, Well done, good and faithful servants. But the third man only got one talent, and he buried it. He didn't invest it at all. And he was called wicked servant. This week before Christmas, how are you investing your life for Jesus? Hmm? These are questions that I believe will help us prepare our hearts for the Christ who came. My friends, the Advent lesson for today is simple but it is also very profound. The Christ our King was born to die for each and every one of us so that we could live in Easter victory as he lives. So it's supposed to be pretty nice weather, I think, this coming week. So maybe go out one evening under the starry skies of uh, West Cleveland and wonder as you wander out under the sky how poor baby Jesus was born for to die for poor ornery people like you and like I. And as you come back from your wandering and your wandering, your wondering and your wandering, maybe pray that beautiful Advent prayer, O come, O come, Emmanuel. Will you bow your heads to pray? Good and gracious God, we praise you that you did something that no one else could have done for us. You made satisfaction for our sins through the death of Jesus Christ. But we praise you also for that Easter victory that right here we light the pink candle of joy because in the midst of our repentance, in the re midst of our reflection this day, we rejoice that we now are able to live, to really live. Help us by the power of your Holy Spirit to live as children of the King the real king, not the rotten kings of this earth, but the real king of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. Amen. I think the praise team has a special gift for us today. Please bring it to us. huh?